how are you? Good. How are you enjoying your skating so Good. far? I'm enjoying it. Yeah? Yeah, I'm enjoying it. Been on the ice a little bit more lately. So we're now, we've now been tasked with running an academy here in Windsor, which is cool. Um, we've said a lot about academies. We've said a lot about academies. But um, I think our messaging has always been consistent. And what I like about it is um, the layout of the day. And kudos to these guys for um, having us run it for them. Because obviously my opinion is biased, but I feel like we do a good job. So uh, for them, it's great. So you've been on the ice now and you're seeing, I'd say, higher end players from 12 to 17 now. Yep. I think. Yep. So how how are your first couple of days, your impression of your first couple of days? working with these guys in addition to the junior team that you're well okay so it's it's interesting because uh interesting in the fact that a lot of these kids i've never worked with or have only worked with a couple times Mm -hmm. so i'm used to having groups that i've been grooming for you know true good point they've come out and i'm like yeah okay you could come out and then they come out and i'm like they get into it and then they know me and i know them so my first day with that academy was didn't know a lot of the kids so um then they're You know, and I could tell, like I could tell after day two that um, like what they, what they do is a lot of drills with, and and I'm not being, I'm not being critical. It's the same thing, man. It's it's the same as we were talking about. They do a lot of drills that um, um, don't necessarily have a real purpose to. There's a lot of uh, little things that I was just on day one that I would just pick apart a little bit. And uh, I was just trying to get a feel for things. But anyways, uh, little things also as well as I told them today, like yeah, uh, the first day that we did it, did the skate, I was just trying to get a feel for where I was at with the kids and their level and stuff like that. One of the things that stuck out to me was, well, uh, this is something that stuck out to me. I told them that today. They're on the ice a lot. And it shows. Not necessarily in a good way. It shows because, you know, you, you when you talk to them, it's like, yeah, let's, what's the next drill? Like, there's no real urgency to learn, like, necessarily. So I had to straighten that out. So, like, explaining to them, like, you're on the ice every day. You're on the ice a lot. And when you're on the ice a lot, it's very easy to just get into going through the motions. And I said, that's not, that can't happen with me, or else this isn't going to work very well. So that was one of the things. I need response. I need you guys to have some energy. I need you to pay attention to little details, which I had to do a couple of times, not like they're in trouble or anything like that. But like the mentality of, well, I'll just, I'm going to be here tomorrow. Like it's almost like it's not that important that every little detail matters. But so anyways, my, I don't know if that made sense, but like I think it was a lot of uh, kids with a lot of ice um, and – not a lot of urgency. They don't appreciate necessarily the ice that they're getting and they don't necessarily, and maybe that was a function of the coaches they've had on the ice. Like it was just like, yeah, like we're just here. Let's just get through this stuff. Whereas it's not going to be like that with me. So, and and then from a skills perspective, uh, I did a lot of teaching on starting on day two and um, because that's what needs to happen. And uh, like a lot. Like there's a lot there, so I gotta start a little bit, a um, little bit farther back than I thought I would necessarily have to, but it's all good. It's all good as long as they they're willing to continue to learn, and um, and yeah. So I got my point across, and I think they got theirs, and it's gonna be different because, you know, one of the uh, uh, the goalie coach that was helping out said uh, it's a lot different because uh, a lot of times when I go on the ice, when, like the, this goalie coach, when he goes on the ice with people, he goes, it's just they're trying to keep kids moving as fast as they can. And I go, yeah, and there's, there's yeah, and oh, we'll just add a pylon here and a pylon here, and there's, there's a new drill. It's like, it's different. So there's got to be a lot of teaching. So he goes, yeah, he liked it a lot. He goes, he, like he got off the ice and he goes, I really like that. Yeah, and I love, that's the, that is a difference that, at least for us, and I'm sure there's more, other trainers that do the same like that's a difference between what we bring versus what you normally get yeah you know well well, you were you popped your head out there for a little bit and i think at the point where i was doing a little bit of uh retrieve sort of retrievals but like like there's a whole bunch of things that are involved in it but like just in that one little drill what i what i noticed is 
kids would like, let's say they're grabbing a puck backwards to pivot and move the puck up. Just that little transition there took time because kids were not taught proper proper transitions. So they're rifling pucks in bad angles. Not the puck's not in a good position. They're not get their, they don't get themselves in a position to be effective after they make a a, a pass. Um, it's learning how to maneuver a puck properly so that you can get yourself in a good position and stuff like that. And, um, and, and it was a big thing. The kids were looking at me like, Oh, okay. And I said, does it work? They go, yeah. <laughs> but like, so you think about it, they've been on the ice for a long time. Like, I don't know how long they've had instructors and stuff, but it's like that needed to be pointed out guys. Like, yeah. You know, I, I was talking to, so two of the dads were up top before I poked my head out watching. And I was saying to them too, that's why, I, um, because we've been talking about this for a bit and why I was trying to convince you to come back and do it because the teaching that you get when you talk about skill, it's what we always talk about. It's this is now actual game applicable skill. It's not stick handling, shooting, skating in isolation to do a drill. It's always even like the one drill I saw you did. Uh, players, they had to pick the puck up off the wall. Then they're coming up, making a move, making a pass, going in the net, getting, getting the shot off quick, not dusting it off, whatever. Where a lot of times coaches with that same drill they wouldn't have the puck up the wall part. They wouldn't have the make sure it's off your stick quick part. They wouldn't have the get your feet moving after you pass part. And those are the skills that make you good. It's not the chicky chickies and, and the skating and all that. Like all of that, everyone has. Everyone will have that, you know? So you can just see the difference just in a couple of days. And I noticed that even with the, the U18 team that I'm on the ice with, it's like, I was I, I was talking and it's it just goes back again to the kids don't know any different or any better. So we were doing a we were doing a, a breakout to a neutral zone kind of transition with a three on two at the end. And I asked them before the practice when I'm drawing up some of the drills. I'm like, do you guys do like neutral zone stuff? Have you done some breakouts and neutral zone stuff? And like, yeah, yeah, we do that like every practice. And I'm like, oh, okay, perfect. So this and this and this and whatever. Like, let's go. So I had to stop 27 times just for those little details. And I'm like, I thought you could, didn't you guys say like you've been, like, well, yeah, but we don't really do it like with a system or anything. We just <laughs> like kind of, it's, it's flow. It's a drill. Yeah, it's yeah. flow. Yeah. It's flow with no teaching. And that's what a lot of these skill sessions are, right? So it's interesting to see the, the difference when you're now trying to actually teach the game and the skills of the game, not just the skills of playing with your hockey stick. Because that's how you get, like, have you seen this get one guy, if, I forget his name. He's like this huge guy on uh, on social media. It's not Pavel Barber. It's it's another one of these guys that's really good at stick tricks. And he goes on like on the ice at NHL games, like in the intermissions, and he does like all this really cool shit. And it's sick. It's really cool. It's not hockey though. Like that guy doesn't play in the NHL, right? It's so the stick tricks and all that is great because it's fun to do and it's cool to do. But with respect to playing the actual game, that is an irrelevant thing. That doesn't matter if you can do it or not. You know, and that's where the confusion comes in with a lot of the kids is they think that the more you can flip around the puck, the better you are at hockey. And it's like, that's not, that's not the case, you know? So well, I had a couple of them this morning. I was doing one just to get their, uh, uh, their uh, backward to forward passing and stuff like that transition. And uh, a couple of them obviously have spent a lot of times doing 10 and twos, Mohawk turns, which is good. It's a, it's a good thing, but like it was inappropriate. Yeah. When, yeah. When are you supposed so to say like, like you're in a position now, like you can't, do this and you can't do that so anyways but that's the thing it's like there's times and places for things so doing doing the just doing all kinds of skill stuff it's good it's good at times but you need to put need to put it into a game situation yeah 100 percent. so um <clears throat> with that i'm going to kind of follow up from uh, what we talked about a little bit last week um how i've been posting these videos about basics and nobody knows basics and I'm getting the, the response I'm getting is, is really, has been really uh, positive. So I thought it'd be good to kind of go back and, and maybe work on like another little mini series about actual technical things with respect to actual game stuff and game decision making. And maybe you could say it falls under the, everyone likes to say hockey IQ kind of thing, where it's like how to make decisions playing the game. That's kind of what this is going to be for. So today I wanted to focus on uh, some D zone because... Again, like I did, I did a D zone drill yesterday and like weak side, this is U18. Again, weak side winger, D zone coverage, doesn't know where to stand. And it's like, how, <laughs> how do you not know where to stand at this point? You someone, no one taught you. And it's not, this isn't shame on the kids. This is shame on the coaches, shame on the people that have supposed to 
they were supposed to develop these guys to understand the game. Uh, so anyway, so I want to start. I want to start on that. Um, before I do that, I wanted to just mention um, our live show thing again. So we had to move the date. We got to move the date. So we ended up having a one of the speakers ended up having a schedule conflict for the nineteenth. So we're gonna revisit that. Uh, maybe push it out to the end of end of March. Try to get another date where they can line up because I really like the speakers that we had. So I don't want to try to find replacements and stuff. So we're gonna try to switch it up. So people that already registered because uh, a bunch of you guys already registered. Um, I'll keep you in there so you don't have to redo it later. Um, but just it's not gonna be on pause for now. So I'll announce it again when we have the date set um, for you guys. So so that's the only thing I wanted to update on for for the live show. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by the PowerTech Online Membership Program. If you've been listening to Andy and I wondering, hey, how are they able to get all this podcast content out there? Well, that's because of our members. For just $9.99 a month, you can get access to our online video library, including hundreds of videos of Coach Andy teaching, and have the option for consultation calls with Andy or myself to go over anything you need. We can cover training, nutrition, coaching, parenting, agents, the junior college hockey path, whatever's of interest to you. You'll also be able to participate in our popular Ask Me Anything episodes, have access to special discount codes, and be given priority for any PowerTech in-person camps or events. If you like what we're doing here and you want to support us, this is the best way to do it. Visit powertechhockey.ca slash memberships or find the link in the description of this video to learn more. So uh, moving on to our D-Zone stuff. The first thing I wanted to start off with, we did this before, but I want you to start going over your quadrant thing, talking about defensive zone coverage in general. Um, Unless you have anything else you want to say before well, we start. Well, I, I think maybe before that, I think just a philosophy on de- de- defensive play. So I think, I mean, w- when you get to the highest levels, if you're, if you're not a good defensive player, then you're, you're probably not going to play a whole lot unless you are the one, that, that really small percentage of players that can just kind of cheat the game a little bit or because they're there to score goals. So they might get away with a little bit, but for the most part, if it's, if someone's listening to this, it's most likely this applies to you that you got to be a good defensive player. And then that, the question is, what is defensive? What does that mean? So a lot of defensive play is what you do without the puck, right? It's patience and all that kind of stuff. But I, I think more importantly than that, even is that you take pride in it because there's not necessarily a lot of um, recognition from the average person on good defensive play but the people that matter like the people that maybe give you your ice time or people that if you're looking at moving on people that scout the people that evaluate you understand it and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're they understand what system you're playing but they see the effort so they see that there's a big effort that you don't want to get scored on and when i talk to players a lot of the times when we do an offensive drill, like getting to the net and stuff, like sometimes that's that's a problem too. But like, you know what I mean? Like if you go in the offensive zone, guys seem to be a little bit more hungry. Whereas in the defensive zone is like something that they're supposed to do. And if they don't, nah, you know, it's, yeah. you know. They, have, they have to do it. It's not they that have they get to, do to it. or like, whatever. Like yeah. back checking. And, and, you know, when you have opportunities to be really good defensively, it's like the, the effort. If, if, if you say the four check is at 100%, the... D zone might be 50% or 70%, which is not good enough. So I would say to players that if you want to win over scouts and coaches and do things that stick out, stand out more than other people, is that to be very good defensively. Like really, really, really have effort in your defensive zone. And that helps your team, helps you, and it helps yourself. So, it, it, and it's a mindset. And again, like I said, it's not something that a lot of people, um, like the average mom and dad don't really look at um, a really nice, not even a really nice def- defensive play, a simple defensive play, right? So um, that's that's a mindset that I would I, I would like people to really value is to be a really hardworking defensive player. And then what happens is when you're a very good defensive player, your coaches trust you, people that watch the game, that understand the game, that evaluate you like that part, um, but you also create offense from it. So that's really important to me. So I, I just really encourage people not to minimize the the importance of defensive zone play. And I get it. There's not a whole lot of people that are going to write an article about how good someone is in the D zone. They'll put show a highlight of a goal, 
or a really good offensive play, but your average defensive zone play is not really talked about that much. Although the other night, there was a player I was watching and got a nice goal. It was a really nice goal. And I told him after, I said, what I really liked it was my favorite part of that game. And he goes, I know. I go, go ahead, tell me. He goes, it's the, the back check. I said, yeah, you had one of the best guys in the league going on a two-on-one and you busted your ass back and you're down in the, you know, the far corner, busted your back, ass back and knocked the puck away from him. And I think people notice that, but they don't maybe necessarily, some people don't notice the significance of how hard that was and how big of a play that is because it could have been in the back of the net. And it could have been very easy to come back kind of hard and kind of maybe glide a little bit saying, I'm not sure if I'm going to get him, but you put the effort in to do it. And so if you take a game and if everything's equal and if someone's really watching and valuing for a player, what do I like about a player? That play stands out big time. So you do that once, twice a game. That's as big as scoring a goal. Because now someone evaluating goes, this guy cares at this end of the ice too, which is critical. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is it's one way to frame it because everyone understands what it feels like to want to score, but it's trying to adopt the feeling of not of wanting to not get scored on. That's an, a way to frame it in your head. Um, instead of just, oh, you got to be good in your D zone. It's like, do not let the other team score, which that sounds obvious. But if you haven't ever articulated that in your mindset, like I will not get scored on, because I don't, I don't ever remember thinking that when I was playing youth hockey. And it would have been good to have that, and not as a first thought. But instead of just being like, okay, I need to be on, I need to cover my D, or I need to help my defenseman in the in the corner. Like, yeah, you want that, but it's why? It's, it's we're not getting scored on. I'm gonna not get scored on, and caring about that will give you a little bit more sense of urgency. Yeah, in your own D zone, which which is great. And then the other thing about mentioning the back check type stuff, that defensive zone play for anyone who's ever been on a bench, like on a team on the bench, and maybe for for parents listening, if you haven't been in the situation, you don't know uh, what it feels like when you have a guy that has a big shot block or has a really great back check or some type of phenomenal defense, like grinding the puck on the wall where they eat it for 15 seconds on their own with two guys battling against them. Like these kind of big defensive plays energize the team, maybe not as much as a goal, but it gives a significant boost to the, to the boys on the bench. So that's another thing as a player and as a coach, you feel that too, but as a player, especially it's like you, you should know what it feels like when you're on the bench and you watch a guy have a great defensive effort, what that does to the team just as much as, as what it does when you score a goal. When you score a goal, it boosts guys, but when there's a really hard defensive play, that gives guys on your team a big boost too. And real hockey people that are scouting or coaches or whatever, they know that. And that's why, to your point of if you want to stand out, you want to get people to notice you, that defensive stuff that often goes unnoticed by the general population or isn't as valued, the team values it. And you can feel that when it happens in a game. Because I, th- I feel like, honestly, the the biggest moments in a game for a team are probably score, scoring a goal, not even all the time, but scoring a goal in a certain context would be number one. Second, I think would be that big defensive play. And then third would be like a fight or a big hit or something like that. Like that's probably the order of momentum as it, uh, for, for certain teams or for most teams, depending on like the circumstance, obviously, but in general, it's right up there. So if that's something that you can adopt in your game, you can bring a lot of value to your team, the guys on your team, by bring, bringing that energy or bringing that momentum shifter through a play that seems like nobody would really care, but but the team cares, the coaches care. You know what I mean? Well, so. and I think the, the, the best way to uh, for a team to respond and be a really good, really, really proud of being a defensive team and you get the most out of your players would be coming from the top down, right? So if a coach preaches that and rewards that and praises uh, the defensive effort, then you you probably will see more, right? As opposed to just getting the guy that gets the goal. So now maybe a guy that is, you know, you get possession or almost get possession, the guy blows his own because he's, you know, because he can cheat a little bit. Maybe he second guesses that because he understands the importance of of playing the D zone. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, so let's start. I want, I want you to go, um, 
review because we've did this in a podcast before, but I think it's better because we're going to stick on it for longer this time is just do that. I like that quadrant method. I sure. made a video on this the other day that a lot of people really like. So I'll just let me adjust the camera and then we'll go. Sure. Yeah. So that, that quadrant that I was telling you about now, this is not, it is what it is, but this is like the simple form of defensive zone coverage. There's, there's more advanced ways. There's, uh, there's, there's things where, well, let me just do the the quadrant first. So it's for me, it's like fairly simple, right? You've got the dots down, and you got half the ice. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> right? That's what you got. So what what this simply means is uh, this would be a right wing, and this would be left D or first guy in, and you would have a center, and you would have right here. You would have a, a left wing, and you would have the other D. That's that's the quadrants. So why is that important? Well, this is like, and, and this is, there's different ways to defend, but this is, you know, for most people in youth hockey, this would make sense to you. So if I'm, when you think of the defensive zone, it's not really, you got to work really hard, but it's not as, it's not as big of an area. Like it's, when you break it down into a quadrant, it makes it fairly simple. So if I'm a right D, you know, on a normal rush or normal dump in or normal play, this is your quadrant, really and truly below the dots to the post ish, right? And it's hard work from here, from this area. Uh, if you're the D, you're taking some net front, right? And here, the left D would take some net, net front. What a mess, eh? I knew that was going to happen. That thing's rolling around. You're going to take like the front of the net and you're going to look for passes and whatever you take the strong post look for pucks the 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 centerman is going to always be helping out down low right and then you have your weak side winger so in this case would be the left winger would be kind of in the slot or more or less in the middle and you you're covering passes and loose pucks here and then you'd have your right winger kind of when there's when there's no action, having some patience, not getting any lower than the dot, but kind of on the dot with his butt to the I'm gonna do the butt, the butt to the middle of the ice with a stick in here, so you can see. So now it's really simple, which now this is where the hard work like the hard work is actually not hard work. Like if there's a lot of play down here and you've got a a four, then now I'm talking about the four checkers. You've got a center and another winger, maybe even another guy, and you got your D and your center in here, and everything's bunched up. It's real tempting to just keep drifting down and get involved in that fray. But what happens is if if you get if you get sucked into that, then all of a sudden you've left all this open. So this guy's got a lot of room to make a play. So in that situation, if this right winger has his ass, this is the crack of his ass. <laughs> Uh, here, head on a swivel stick here, anything that comes up the wall, now it's just quick feet with a good stick, right? Yeah. So, okay, so so let's let's go back to this, like, the quadrants. So just draw the quadrants out. Okay, so do quadrants. So we have right winger in the top here, right D below. And we have left D, left winger on the other side. Right? So general, So in general... When the puck is in your quadrant, you know your man number one. That's it's your go. Okay. So if we get, I want to talk. We're going to talk about like different situations in a second. So now let's go to the centerman's, the centerman's kind of coverage zone. So do you want a different color? I'll give you a different color if you want. So if you're, so if you're centerman now, where is my centerman's in general? What is his area D zone? Because we only got four here. S something like that something like that so their their job is getting second in on pucks on either side of the net yeah no no i'm not trying to sound advanced or like complicate things like when you're back checking it's like a four check okay when you four check because the, if you're four checking and you're a right winger if the puck goes on the left side and you're the first guy it doesn't mean you don't go right so we're calling this we could call this you know, in, in four checking F1, F2, F3. So like who the first guy, but like in general terms, your right D is going to be like usually taking a rush or working down low. And your sentiment is like 
your centerman is like a second D all the time. So that your sex, your centerman has to work from the corner to this corner and they got to be, you know, working really hard in, right. in a, in the basic sense of things. Yes. Yeah. So then if we do, um, these like transition zones, this is, I like talking about this because this is kind of where the problems happen. So may you tell me if you agree with this or not. Sure. If, if I'm the offensive team, yeah. um, when I think of it in terms of this quadrant yeah. type method, and then if the centerman's on the, in the hi hat area there, yeah. As the offensive team, I feel like you're trying to get pucks into those transition areas of because course. that's where confusion happens. Yes. On the D side. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about a couple scenarios where the puck either goes up the wall and transitions into where that right winger is involved. Yeah. Let's start with that scenario. Okay. And then we'll go to if it goes behind the net. So same same kind of quadrant thing. Okay. So you're saying. Yeah, so we have right wingers in his spot. Pucks in this area. Yeah, pucks in the corner. Right wingers here. Yep, we have a right D on the puck in the corner. Yeah. And then starts slipping it starts up. slipping up. Yeah. So let's say we have a D and a centerman in the corner, and yep. they're doing their battle. Yep. Now the puck starts creeping up yep. to that transition area. So this yep. is where now like the communication handoffs, that kind of stuff starts yep. to happen. So w let's say that starts happening, and then you can just take it from there. How do we transition between quadrants now when the puck yep. switches? Yeah, well... So obviously, if the puck starts coming up, like this guy, th this this center or this D will, depending on who has the guy, starts coming up. You want to keep flushing him up, right? So your defensive positioning is certainly not on the outside of the of puck carrier. So say this is the puck carrier, you certainly don't want to be on this side because you're giving him the inside of the ice, right? So number one would be take the defensive side of the puck, which would be so the guy starts carrying it take that step to the inside. So now he's got, my drawing is terrible, guys. I'm sorry. That was supposed to be an arrow, <laughs> right? Take that step to the inside of the ice so that when that puck carrier is going, he has no choice. He can't come back. Like if he does, you're a step away with a stick, right? And you keep your stick kind of in that lane so that he doesn't have room to play. And as he starts coming up, then it's angle this guy out more. So this guy can maybe finish a hit. This guy could finish a hit, or you angle him off the wall a little bit. But this is now it becomes this guy's, um, this guy's job. Okay. And then the centerman that was there. Now you're looking at: Is there a loose guy going to the net? Does he stand down low? Now you're just kind of working down here. But like, depends on who's flushing it out. Like whoever's got the puck carry off the wall, you'd take it with him. And this guy's taking the inside position again on that guy. So like, the next phase of all that stuff would be not phase, but the, the next position, like when in doubt, when you're scrambling, like things do get confused, then you just come kind of get back to this. We, 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 a lot of people call this the house, right? The house where you're in the middle of the ice. So like if you're ever confused, just take a couple steps back and get your butt to the middle and then you can flush guys out. Because they're if you're out here, they're a threat. If you're inside, you just make, like if you're inside the house, like if you're confused, you come back into this area, then they have to work against you, right? It's one on ones or one on twos. Yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. So then if we go behind the net yep. now and that puck transitions up side to side behind the net. No, if it's a pass? Either. If it's a pass, okay, if so it's a So let's say they, they do a long cycle, let's, let's call it. Well, then, then it's, it's kind of simple this D that's taking a net sees that and he's just taking a couple quick steps. This guy might support like the D that D or the center that, well, let's say it's the D might support to make sure it doesn't come back. And the centerman starts his transition over to the other side, right? So this D comes down, this winger that was in this quadrant here now becomes over here to the dot and everything just transfers over very simply. D goes to here. Centerman will either be helping or if, but he's got to have a little bit of patience. Centerman is very important. They got to have patience. Mm -hmm. Right. So then if that's, if that's a guy carrying the puck to the other side now, okay. so it's not as easy as that D just going and picking it up. Right. So, well, okay. So now if this, if this guy's carrying the puck now, well then we need hard work. Right. Mm -hmm. So it depends like who, who lost him. Like who's the, the free guy. Let's say the right D got beat. Got beat. Right, well, then, got beat. Yeah, then this guy's got to start sealing him off, and this guy steps out. Okay, so if the guy, but if the guy with the puck is winning that race, yep, 
gets behind the net. Gets behind the net. What does my other D do that's in front of the net? Does he go? Does well, he stay? You, you can't just go. He's right. got to have some patience, right? So he's waiting. He, like he's waiting, head on a swivel. And then once he gets there, he just takes that post. Mm-hmm. Like get that post, put your stick down. If you feel like, because uh, you don't want, the last thing you want to do is just like get there too early and then he comes across. Yeah. So that's kind of where like the handoff yeah. point. This is, is the hardest be. part for kids to yes. learn. Right. And even coaches to teach yeah. because different guys, some people have different rules for that. Right. So, so this is what, this is the, what I want to hammer in on because yeah. I want to give like some clear instruction on yeah. how to do this. So that transition point based on the quadrant that you drew goes behind the net. That line goes behind yeah. the net. Right. Yeah. So if my D that's supposed to be on that guy is getting beat. So if my right D coming from this side is getting beat going behind the net, that left Maybe. yeah so yeah. that that guy carrying the puck is gonna end up on the other side so now he's in the other d's quadrant yep so does my front side d go does he stay or talk about how like the handoffs work whether that's a communication thing or whatever well, it's how a we- totally it's a to- totally communication the, the thing that i'll tell you the one thing you don't want unless you have a system like this which which you know like they're they're totally are but like for youth hockey this this is for youth young youth hockey the, the less confusing it is, the better. So if the problem is, is if this guy decides that he's going to go, right, the, the left, sorry, that's a lefty, left winger, instead of holding his quadrant, if he decides, oh, I'm going to go get this guy, and then this guy goes and gets this guy, and the center might go, and then, you know, this then there's a whole bunch of options. Now you're going to, like, if the puck comes out, now you're just scrambling, everyone runs around. So what I would say, especially in youth hockey, would be the the net front D has got his head on a swivel, right? And if he sees this, he's holding. This guy's coming. He's holding. You know, he's maybe got a stick in a lane. If there's no pressure, he's got to play like it's almost like a two on one. So you don't overcommit to anything. And then if if he holds it and the guy cuts, he's there. If the guy keeps going, then he can make that quick transition over to the other side of the net and then stick down. And then, so now if he stops, you stay. And if he continues to go, now he's yours. And then the winger gets here. The center is going. The winger's going. This winger will come back down to the slot. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. You sure? Yeah, that makes sense. I know it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. And then you could throw a bunch of scenarios, but that's the gist of it. Yeah, so the the point of my bringing up those two cases, because I want to show, based on the quadrants that you drew, what happens when pucks get to those transition areas and the emphasis being there actually, there still isn't a right answer. It's just about, we have to have good communication because if the D chasing that guy says, no, you go. And you're like, Oh, he said me go, I go. Now we have a good handoff. If nobody says anything that D's chasing and then the other D isn't sure what he's supposed to do. Now he starts chasing. That's where we get pockets opened up, lanes are opened up and that's where the the problems start to happen. Right. So, um, well, go ahead. You, you have some, Okay, so I want to go. I want to try to go kind of by position now, through the D through that D zone, like based on what those quadrants are. I want to talk about each guy. So if we start, let's say, draw out the quadrants with the right winger, and I want to talk specifically about what is the right winger's job, um, in his quadrant. So we got right winger up top. So when he doesn't have the puck, if the puck is in the corner, just talk talk about the yeah talk about. Yeah, talk about the positioning of that right winger right now. Okay, the right winger. So, right, because because here's here's why I want to talk about this because the right winger seems like he's useless right now because he's not involved, but yeah. you but you are involved. Totally. So involved. it's important that you know where you are in the ice. Like, where are you in space? This is something that um, I was talking about with our guys yesterday. So if the puck is in that corner, as the right winger who's really just standing there. What are you supposed to be doing? Where are you supposed to be? And what should your thought process be here? Yeah. Okay. So the puck goes down to the corner. So like, let's just say it's even on a back check and it's in the corner. So what you're, what you're going to do on the back check is not going to back check like this. What you're going to do on the back check is you're going to come in through the dots. Okay. So I, I always tell people that until your coach says you're back checking too hard, go as hard as you can and put the brakes on in the like hash marks even, and then come out. Okay, so because anything could happen, right? There could be a turnover, and the 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 great thing is, is like if there is a turnover and you're in the middle of the ice, then you're still defending. But if you're out here, then it's a lot of work to get back to the middle. Okay, so once 
once you realize, okay, so you, you've, you've back checked or, or turnovers happened. That's why I always say get to the get to the middle of the ice and then sort it out. Okay. Once, <sighs> unreal. <laughs> once you realize, okay, there's a battle going on here, and he's looking at making plays. Okay. What you could be thinking, like, and you'll have a lot of coaches say, stay on your D. Right. Okay, that's that's okay. You eliminate that pass maybe, but then you open up all this, right? So you're saying if the right winger is high up on that D, yeah. like staying right by him. Yeah, if, he, if the right winger is staying up here, it might appear that you're doing more. And and some people do it, and it's okay. They're just they're, they're making sure that man-on-man man is working, right? So they just don't want anything to come up top. And that's and that's fine. But I, I think the kids, I think you're, you're better off with this because – these guys can work, work, work. So the, the if the puck actually does come up there, it takes a little bit of time, but that's what you're reading, right? That's what you're reading. You're looking for, you're not worried about all the stuff behind you. You're just worried about this this quadrant here, right? Because you know that if we've communicated well, if we're taught decently, that the left winger is here and there's a D here. Like that's a lot of people, right? And then you have a, a centerman that could come out and all that kind of stuff, and you're here. So it's a lot of people. So that puck squirts out. Like what I'm thinking here is like you're waiting and waiting for a puck to squirt out and you're reading it. That's what you're looking at doing. And if this guy slides over, it's like, fine, you're still in good position. They got to get the puck across the ice, right? If he starts sliding down, that's maybe you can cheat a little bit, but this is still your position. So now if the, so I'm waiting for a puck to come or puck or, or, or a play to start moving off the ice. That's all I'm waiting for. So so first of all, two things. Yeah. One, one I first want to mention, just the fact that the, that winger is not on the boards. Yeah. So this was an issue I had yesterday at our practice yep. is the right wingers were coming back to their D zone coverage yep. and they were too far over where they're not in the shooting lane of that D. Yeah. So a good rule of thumb is like, this is hockey one-on-one is you're between your guy and your net. Yep. You're in that, sh- in yep. that shot lane. So right where you drew him, if you draw that D that's up on the blue line yep. now, that right winger is in a nice straight line in that defenseman shot lane to the net yes. number one. Yes. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is why why are you drawing that right winger that low? So I'm not saying he necessarily has to be right up next to that D, but why isn't he maybe up in this area or something? Like what's the purpose of him being right like kind of on that boundary line? If someone's going to score, will they have a better chance of scoring from out here or in here? So if you're here, like you're taking away the middle of the ice again. So sticks are in the, in the area. And if this guy does slip out, you, you, your stick is there, uh, whatever. Your stick is there, it's easy. If you're up here, then it just creates a lot of more, a lot more work. And then you've opened up. So if he's up here, right, if this guy happens to slip through, now you're working hard. And now what happens? You cross here. Now you're out of your quadrant, more or less. And now you've got a lot of guys down here. It takes one puck to go like this, and now you got this guy to come in. So it's like it just – it really takes – like, I know it doesn't, it seems like you're not working, but that's where I say the, the hard work actually comes in, is hard work is not working. Yeah. It's taking the patience to say, wait, 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 wait. But when there is that loose puck or when that puck does come up to that D, now you're working. Yeah. Now it's, but but look, think about it. It's You're not running around like crazy. That's straight line. What's that? Five to eight steps? Depending how big you are, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Same thing, right? And it's a stop start. So it's like, it's, it's hard, but it's easy. Yeah. Or simple. Right. So, so talk, maybe talk a little bit about that. So if the puck comes up, up top to your D now as that right winger, maybe talk about the importance of the, the stop start kind of thing. What do you mean by that? Cause I, I find a lot of times guys will get excited about trying to get up on the, on the break and maybe they go for that chip around the D or whatever, or they go run at the guy and then do the big loop de loop. So talk about, um, why why the stops and starts thing is like such a harped on thing of straight lines back and forth in that little zone where now it's not a lot of ice, but you're doing a lot of back and forth when there's yeah. activity going on up yeah. there. You know what I mean? Yeah, just simple. Like you get there quicker and you're in you're in position. So like if you run out, like first of all, you want to take angles, right? So like let's say the D was here and the puck comes up. Well, if you, if you go straight at him like this, you've made it, a little bit easier him for him to maneuver. So what your job is now is to keep the puck to the outside. So the angle that you want to take is like not huge, but it, you want to angle it so that your stick is here, right? 
so that he, or sorry, I'm sorry, that your stick is here, like to force him down so that he can't make a cross ice pass so that he has to kind of go this way, right? Does that make sense? Yep. Okay, so like you're going out on a little bit of an angle, like taking the inside position so that he can't come this way. So he has to go this way. Well, look what's happening here. You got your centerman coming out to help too, right? Yep. So you're taking away that time. So now if he continues to skate, now you have an angle, your stick is switch to here to keep him to the outside right so the number one thing is take the proper angle to him which is to keep him to the outside not the inside yeah yeah and that, that doesn't mean you're giving up the shot lane either like you're right. still in the shot lane but yeah. you're just slight taking that yeah. slight angle where you're yeah. pushing him making him feel like he has to go back down the wall where it's a little bit more safe yeah. kind of thing and that would be like that would be if it got out there hard and like he's in control but if it's like a little bobble or like a slower one coming out there then then it's like really aggressive take away that puck and maybe it's a hit or whatever but but so anyways if if you if you if you don't stop what happens then you that means you turn right so if you turn well if you go let's just say you happen to turn this way well then you've opened up all this ice for him to make a play and then you have to do a lot of work to get back here if you go this you know if you go and you and you do a turn instead of a stop then now you've got to recover this way. So then that's where you start doing this as a player instead of, and that, that becomes hard work, instead of stopping, getting back, stopping in that little quadrant of ice. Right. Does that make sense? Yep. No, that's good. So let's go to... It's simple to me. Like, it's simple, but it's like, I, I don't want to make it sound too simple or too hard. It's not that hard. It's just straight lines, no, stop, start. But it's it's the, the important thing is that it's the details. That's why this is important because like everybody can understand when you're talking about okay this is your quadrant but it's like your behavior now when you're in there is important so that slight angle because it's one of the most common you want the younger the kid the more this happens the guy just runs at the guy straight and it's a simple move left or move right and you're already around the guy you know so the concept of angles and stops and starts and those things that that is what's important about the d-zone stuff because yeah. we could just say here's your quadrant like yeah, there's your there's, like an idiot. yeah there's yeah. your episode guys like here yeah. you go yeah. you know but it's more there's more to it than that so if we do the same scenario now but we'll talk about the right side d so if the puck crosses up so obviously if if the puck is in your corner as the defenseman then you're engaged in the battle if the puck now goes up the wall where maybe it goes to their d at the point or that right winger now is taking uh, priority as number one guy yeah so how does my right defenseman now recover without the puck Yep. Where where do they go? What's their thought yep. process now? Well, your thought process is when in doubt, what do we do? Go to the house. Yes. When in doubt, like that's a simple rule, right? When in doubt, get back to the middle of the ice. That, it's that simple, right? If Now, if you have a little bit more confidence or whatever, and you, you want to just make sure that, let's say the for, F is for forward, and you're in this battle, you want to make, make sure you get inside position at, at at worst that and that and that's basically it and then you're looking to the outside if he's if he's going to the net you've got inside position between the net and him and you're taking him to the net taking the stick very very simple and it's the same principle right it's hard work it stops it starts and like i said when in doubt like when you get in you get in trouble when you try to do too much sometimes but if you uh, when in doubt, if you just hurry up back here and stop, or here and stop, anywhere in this area, and this guy maybe even floats back, if this guy makes a pass back down, it's not the end of the world. You could just take a step and pivot. You're back in the battle. And you're back yeah. in the battle. And this guy's just a couple steps back in the battle. Mm -hmm. So the, why I love like how you do the quadrant thing is because it's a good way to teach. Because one of the things that gets guys into trouble that I notice is when the puck leaves their quadrant, let's say, they start looking at what's going on up there. So it's important to know whether the puck is there or not, like you're responsible for what's happening in your quadrant. So if that guy that you were just on in the corner, when the puck leaves your quadrant, that guy is still there. That guy's still where in your in your area. So you need to know where he's at and how to be on the D side of that guy and how to defend that guy. That's still the guy that you need to be watching. It's not like, oh, the puck's out of my quadrant. Now I'm done. I'm, I'm all done for the day or yeah. whatever, right? So that Well, you got to, you got to like uh, higher level hockey too or aggressive players. Like you could be a D down here. Okay, let's say the puck, <laughs> I am drawing letters that I don't know exist. 
that's supposed to be RW. And let's say this is the forward. So let's say he makes a quick pay and the D was coming down. It's actually happening quick. And this guy, they, they understand give and goes. And he makes a play and he drives hard, right? That's where, that's where, that's where the hard work is. Like, it's not lackadaisical. It's like, that's where you have to get back. But again, it's take the inside position and get there as fast as you can. As long as you get to this area fairly quick, you're in pretty good shape. And then your next thing is you're looking for taking away a stick for passes. Right. Um, so let's talk about uh, net front defenseman then. Same thing. Puck is in this corner. <clears throat> What's my left defenseman now doing? What's his mindset? Whether it's from the co- we'll start from the corner, and then once that puck moves up, let's say to the D in the other quadrant, what is my goes up here? Yeah. So okay. from the corner, what's my lefty doing? Once the puck moves up, what's my lefty doing? The the net front D that's now on like what would be the weak side, I guess. Le- okay. So left front D is taking a stick, take, taking away that threat of a pass. So honestly, when the puck goes out, what else is there to do? Are you doing a box out? Are you doing? Well, a, yeah. Well, okay, yeah. This you is what I'm do, saying. You could right? do that, yeah. But there's no, there's no, yeah. So if you've got a, a forward here, yeah. If the puck comes out here, you want to give him a little, a little push. Don't let him get to the net and stuff like that. But like your positioning is not really changing. But should you be more like? It's because the way I'm thinking about it, if the puck is in the corner, yeah, these guys are trying to get to the front of the net. You're eliminating that option, like you're saying. Once the puck goes low to high. Should you now be changing your mindset to clear the front of the net? Am I just ty- trying to tie up a stick? What is my job now if the puck is up with their D as the guy that's net front? Should I be like just working to get this guy out of my goalie's face? Should I be just worried about getting his stick? Like what's, what well, is my mindset A little, a little now? bit of both. Yeah. Right? A little bit of both. Like, But you could – like if you're the D and there's a guy standing here for a tip or to get a pass, having your hands – like boxing out to me is good, like to give him a shot. But if you see anything, like you want to make his life miserable a little bit, like you, you want to be on him. But the most important part, the most dangerous part is the stick. So if you can get your stick underneath his stick, so when it comes, you're lifting a stick. That would be the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, so then let's go to a weak side winger now. So my left okay. winger, same same situation. Okay. So puck is in the... Was now weak, just for some people, may not know left wing when we say weak side winger the puck is on this side so this side so weak side would be where the puck is not right, right. so and i know that sounds no, no, no. some people like oh okay i, I didn't it, know that so weak side means like there's no pressure over here so you're called the weak side winger doesn't mean that you're weak it just mean there's no pressure there yeah so the weak side wingers so start in puck, the, puck in, in the slot. corner again yeah pucks in here what's my winger thinking number one okay number one is i'm Taking away any passes here, so my puck's in the lane. So I'm looking, uh, taking away sticks any passes. In the lane. Yeah, sticks, sticks in the lane. Yes, yes, yes. Sticks in the lane. Your head's on a swivel. Like this D is probably not over here, so you're not really too worried about him. If he is, that's that's fine. It's just you just turn around and you front him. Um, the, that D is probably somewhere in here. So you just heads on a swivel for to know where he is, and you're looking for anything coming on this side. And then you're looking for if there is a loose puck, then you can. Slash support, for a pass, yeah. slash for support, pucks for puck support. Yep. If we go up to the up to the D. So to this D. Yep. Okay. So the puck. So you're the weak side. Yep. Left wing weak side. So okay. that puck the goes puck low goes to high. To here. What changes now? Nothing. Nothing yet. Yep. Because this is not a. Th- that's a huge puck. Yep. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm not an artist. So. That puck goes up to this D, like there's nothing changed. You don't have to go here because w- if you go here, what opens up? You open up the most important part, right? So it's just again, it's patience. So if that puck does come across now, oh my god! If it does come across, then there's your five steps, yep. and you're flexing out, right? You're yep. coming out hard, planting your feet and taking the away, lane. taking yep. away the puck. Make yourself as big as you can when, with the puck here, yep. and then if you can you can do anything is try to get him to go this way so where's your stick if he has control starts moving get your stick here so he can't make the pass and get him going that way and start flushing down yeah and now you're the strong side winger now you're the strong side winger and now yeah you do everything that he was just doing over there so it's so then you work your ass off and then 
we're here. This is this is where you're working now. This you got to work your ass off. Stops and starts to get pucks out. Yeah, now it's in your now yeah. it's in your area. Now he can take a break and relax. Not relax, but be aware. So so we did the strong side winger D, weak side winger D. If we flip sides, it's the same thing. So we're not going to do the same thing. So last piece is going to be the centerman. So same thing. If we got centerman on the uh we, yeah strong side corner. Same thing if we go. He's maybe, let's say, second man in on the battle. So the other D is number one. So that puck, he's engaged in the battle when the puck is there. That's easy. Puck goes up to their D on the strong side. What is my adjustment now as a centerman? And then if that puck switches sides, yep. what, so, what's my adjustment? So the centerman, the, so we're saying the puck went up. Yep. Well, the, the only th- which you're, you're not worried about the puck because with we're trusting each other, right? So it's this guy's job to take to take this now, right? Mm-hmm. To take that area. So he's doing the work. So what am I doing? First thing is, uh, I'm not sure what to do. Okay, real simple. What's the first thing we do when we don't know what to do? Take the middle of the ice away, get back to the house, and then sort it out, right? And then you can look for who's my guy, right? Or, or you had someone and the puck goes up and this guy starts going here, like the offensive player, the forward. Mm-hmm. He, he wants to follow it up the ice. Well, then you're, it doesn't mean that you have to be with him. It just means that you have to be aware of him. So you got to stay, just stay on the inside of him and whatever. Now you could stay with him or if you're not sure, just back it out. Like this is going to be a preference of a team, mm-hmm. right? So, but the, the main goal is take away the middle of the ice. Yep. So if your coach says stay on guys, then when that puck comes out, then stay on the inside of him. That's all. Okay. So now let's go that D swings at D to D. Okay. And now we're switching to the other quadrant, and I'm the centerman now. So I was on my guy, like you said. I'm on the D side of my guy on the other side. How am I adjusting now? You're you're kind of doing the same thing. Like, now you're reading, right? So this winger would have to go out. Mm -hmm. This right winger would have to come down. This D is most likely coming to the middle. Your most important thing is to get to the middle to take away things. Mm -hmm. But, like, obviously, if you don't see – like, if if we're in black and they're in white – if you don't see any white jerseys over here, then you better not. You can't be in too much of a rush. That that's, means they're behind that's you. Exactly what I was wanting yeah. to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just a numbers game, right? Yeah. So now if you see a guy driving to the net, well, that's obviously going to be your, you start getting to the middle of the ice, both yeah. winger and center. And yeah. then you start playing. Like, obviously, they're, they're not going to keep guys over here. You're going to get guys that come over some in some formation like this. Mm-hmm. So you have to get in, in the middle, push them out. So th- that's really important with the centerman because it's the easiest, I think, for the centerman to get lost in their own end. And I think the, a big thing you said exactly the word I wanted you to say is you get in a rush because you feel like I'm the centerman, I need to be everywhere, and you leave that guy that you were just on. So even though the puck has switched into like another area of the ice, you have your guy there, and you need to trust your guy's going to do his job over there. So as the centerman, you can't just be in a hurry to get to the other side of the ice because you know I'm the centerman because now you just left somebody in the open area behind you because you're you now left that area right so that's really important uh as a centerman is there anything else just from like a technical position perspective that you think we should talk about or or can i go to my next thing uh i would say go to your next thing okay. the, only, the only other th- the only other thing is that i would say is when you're doing these jobs when it's time to to, to go go mm-hmm. like go and then but and again I, I can't make this any clearer if you don't if you're not sure what to do if you're not sure what to do, don't stay on the outside. If you're a left D, you're not sure what to do. If you're a right D, you're not sure what to do. Just get here. If you're a center, you're not sure what to do. Get in here. If you're a winger and you're not sure what to do, right wing, left wing, left D. If you, if you're not sure, that's not the worst position you could ever be in. Yep. And then if the puck is anywhere outside of this, you're in good shape. Uh. So. Last thing I kind of want to talk about yeah. is uh, because this is a common thing that I was getting questions about last week is guys getting in the offensive mindset too early. Yes. So I don't, I don't necessarily know how best to, if it's better to try to draw it or just talk about it, but probably talk. Okay. So I'll, you want to flip that? Yeah, I'll switch the camera. So common thing has been like, okay, wingers want to leave the zone early. Um, centerman is curling up too high. And we're still we're still playing D. Like we don't have clean possession. We're we're in a battle. We're in whatever. And guys are cheating to try to go. So talk a little bit about uh, when, at what point, or how to judge when you should be switching from defensive mindset 
to offensive mindset. Like what are the markers where if I'm a winger, it's like, okay, instead of being in my middle area quadrant of the ice, now I'm getting my ass to the boards for a breakout or now I'm getting, so when do those transitions kind of happen where we go from D now we're getting onto offensive mindset. Yeah, It's all based on possession and, and actual possession, not, Oh, it looks like we're going to get possession. I mean, to a certain degree, like if you see a guy going behind the net, if your D or let your D's going to grab a puck and there's zero pressure and he's coming like winding behind the net, like if you're the winger staying in the middle of the ice, then you're not thinking. Like you, you got to get to the wall for an outlet. That, that that just makes sense. But like you're talking more like um, the puck turns over and we ha- we might have the puck. I think the biggest mistake people think is like, oh, I think we have it. I'm going to take off and cheat. Well, the problem with cheating it too early is that you're blowing the zone and then you're leaving offensive being in a defensive position to intercept pucks or whatever. So as a rule of thumb, you don't go until your team has full possession, right? And you make an option. But then again, that's the hard work part. It's like you don't float. Like, so if you're in the middle of the ice, you don't, you don't float there and hope it gets it. Like when you see that you have possession, then you go and make an option for it, right? There's too many. There's a lot of time. Like there's a, there's a, a, a way to create offense from defense called push on possession, and people call it different things. But that simply means is that when you get the puck, all players on your team are told to just go. Right, and it's a, it's a very good tactic if if you're doing it properly, and it doesn't have to be the best pra- passes either. So let's say a D gets the puck, in your in in uh, let's say just underneath the the circle, and he's got control, and then all of a sudden all three forwards are going, they're blowing the zone, and the D just has to chip it out or get it through the middle or whatever, and you actually have a rush, but you ha- but again even on that you have to make sure you have possession before you push on possession. So the most important thing is that you have possession of the puck before you actually start blowing the zone and it's the same thing as you know if you're you used an example earlier that a d has a puck and you're coming on that d and you think that you can just tap it and beat them with some speed it's like make sure that you're taking the defensive side so that if that doesn't work that you're blocking the the puck from right. going back in your zone yeah um i think the, the maybe the last last thing on on that is because i think i think the cue on that first of all what you were just saying the coaching cue on that is exactly what you're saying you need to teach the kids that until there's full full possession or i like saying it as like clean possession because even if even if your your d has full possession and there's a guy right in his face like that's not really good possession yet you know so unless they have that clean possession where it's clear like we're going to get an exit we're going to get a breakout or whatever then you need to be still d-minded and then we switch after that so my last thing which i just kind of thought of this is um how would you practice this so maybe you can give a drill or a couple drills as an example of how do we practice getting our kids to be where they need to be um we talked about a drill. I, I used the drill we talked about yesterday, very super basic of just like, how can we get our kids to get the idea of the quadrants where they need to sure. be and all that. Do you want to put yeah. the camera? On? Okay. So you can do it. You can do something like this. Like, and it, it is actually this basic. Okay. You can start off with pylons, right? Or you could start off. Let's say we've got five guys, one, two, three, four, five guys here. And we have a coach, with a puck here and you can use players, coach, whatever, or whatever you want, whatever you want. So let's, we're not using pylons yet. We're just going to say that. So we blow the whistle and five guys have to come back to your D zone. The puck's in this corner. Okay. So what is obviously the first person going to do when they come back? Go to the puck. Okay. So it doesn't matter if it's this guy here. He's the first guy, which typically in a game, it's going to be a D. Yeah. Okay. So let's say just for it's your right D, just for okay. argument's sake. Yeah, let's the right just say guy it's, supposed the, to be there. it's the D. Yep. Who who's where would the next guy go? To support. Right. So to support would be let's just say it's the center. Yep. Okay. He's supporting the puck. So if the puck gets banged loose, he's there. Where would be the third guy? To the house. In front to of the, the house. Yeah. Right? So let's say it's the left D. And typically, you could sort that out. Like, if you're coming back at the exact same time, you all know what to do. You yep. go to your position. Where would the next guy go? Like, let's say it's the right right winger would go to here. Yep. The left would go to here. Left wing. Right? So, instead of making a mess here, 
we just do that. So we got one, two, three, four, five guys, or sorry, five guys. Mm -hmm. So now you could either have the have the. So coach sorry, they just go go there, stop. Just go there, stop. Yeah, go there, just and stop. Understand your position. Yep. Right, one, two, three. Because especially younger, you might be surprised that oh, I'm a left winger or a right winger, so I go here no matter what. Well, not if you're the first guy. So it's just teaching them. This is the quadrant, like it's mm -hmm. one, two, right? So then you can you could put um, you could use other players, you could use coaches, you could do however you want to do it. You get just move that puck. So let's just say we have another coach. Okay, so we stopped. Make sure their body positioning is good, right? Stick is on puck, butts to the middle. Yes. Right, butts to the middle. This right, this guy's yeah. face the puck. So so to sorry to interrupt you, just to pause. Yeah. So so this is where the actual teaching is now. Yeah. So because you can say, okay, go to your position one, two, three, four, five guys. We get that, but this is where you yep. blow the whistle, you stop them, and you're making these corrections. Are your feet the right way? Right. Are you looking so, the right way? Yeah. Is your stick in the right spot? Right. That's the teaching now. Yeah, so like if you have the right winger, he goes, yes, I'm in my position, and his ass is this way, and his stick is this way. He has no clue what's going on. So yeah, mm -hmm. his butt's to the middle. He can see this guy, right? And he can see everything that's going on in this quadrant, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So like all this, the simplest thing is one, two, three, four, five oh my god if you just okay give it to the coach just pass it to the coach well what are we doing one two three or three four and this guy's down here move the puck up to another coach another player well then it's one right just yeah. you're just shuffling that around yeah right so then you could do it with so that's like number one that's one way you can do it then you could do it with some pressure, right? So you can set up stationary, right? You can put black, 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 and they have a puck, and we're white. So we can say the puck starts here, let's go. Okay, so white, 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 right? Move the puck, and then just, so Switch. they're doing it with a little bit of speed. So it might be an up and a down, and across like so now you're just moving and you can just tweak it from there yeah and then any variation of that will do the basics of that yeah does that make that's, sense it's that's beautiful it really doesn't have to be complicated no. and a drawn out thing it's just that simple yeah so and then and then you, you do something like you can confuse the kids a little bit and throw it like you tell tell your guys tell your coaches like make it go bang 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 or or get some scramble or something like that it's like what do we do yeah. have a have a what do they call it a code name what do you mean? A pl play call? Code name? What do yeah. You mean? So like, so like, what I used to tell Charlie's little team was we call it the five of diamonds. So if we would do that drill, and all of a sudden I'd make a little bit of confusion, maybe I'd carry the puck up and spin here and get guys running around a bit. I'd just go, I'd oh, stop like to it. Get to the house. Yeah. So to get ah. them maybe scramble a bit, I would, I would, I would just yell out five of diamonds. So five of diamonds just simply meant one, two, three, four, five. You're good now. Yeah, get to the house. Reset. So like, I'm so yeah. confused. Get to the house. Get to the house. Like five of diamonds, five of diamonds, five of diamonds, five of diamonds, five of diamonds. It's something that they remembered pretty quick, right? Yeah. So if we'd be scrambling, go five of diamonds, it'd be like real quick, two steps. Everybody would be here and they could sort it out. Yeah. So, that's awesome. Yeah. So it's something. Yeah. I like that. That's good. So so that's that's good for me. I think the, the keys on that I wanted to outline, like I just did this exact drill with our U18s yesterday, except I did it with two full lines of guys. So I had them do that, switch corners, whatever, up to the point. And then I gave them at the end. So we did the four points stop and then i said play and they played for the like 15 seconds play the puck out or whatever and u18s lots to correct like lots to in terms of where how they're standing where they're facing where their sticks are their position lots to correct so if you're younger at a younger age than that i don't care if it's triple a double a a house i don't care there's going to be lots to correct but the important thing to make sure you're teaching stuff that's actually game applicable is to make those corrections when they stop in those positions where should they look? Where should their feet be? Where should their stick be? Like, how should they angle when things start moving? What are the routes when things start moving? Like, these are the, this is your coaching. This is being a coach, you know? So it's important that if you watch this and you're like, okay, great drill. I'm going to use that in practice. But the kids just go to their spot and stop. And then they switch and they stop. And there's nothing said about anything. When the game happens and now there's stuff happening, 
they're going to be out of position. They're going to get lost. They're going to be turned around. They're going to be facing the wrong way. And that's where the, the, the problems start happening. Right. And this was the exact thing I had did with in our practice yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And so not to, not to make it sound like everything's just so simple. There's there, it, it can get very confusing because if you play against guys with speed or they can cut back and they can, you know, pick and all that stuff, that's where, that's where it gets hard or behind the net. That's a really tough play for some people, and some coaches have different rules for different things, and it makes it can make it confusing. Or, but but the beautiful thing is that you know your quadrant and you know where the work is. From from that little basic, you can if you understand it and you do it well. Then if you do something like where, you know how I said the the strong side winger stays on the dot. Well, if you have a system where it's like no, the strong strong that right winger is going down, going hard, like going down hard. Well, then it's you have a system where the centerman is like working his ass off, like skating, we call it striking, right? Striking up, striking down. But like, that's more advanced. So like if a guy's watch is a junior coach and watching this and he goes, well, that's, <laughs> we do like, you guys an idiot. No, not, no, we're not idiots. This is like for, for the basic of hockey. And then it gets in more intricate. It can get very hard, but like, I don't want a 12 year old overthinking diesel. I just want you to be very good at it. Yeah. And then, as you get older, and typically it's much older, like junior, like OHL, where your coaches are going to start teaching you switches behind the net, like when you're allowed to cross a zone or how to take a stick or how to front a man or pin, you know, hit and pin, all these different things or can openers and all that kind of stuff. That stuff's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about the basic rotations and patience and like any coach can use this type of defensive zone coverage and be successful yeah right? and this is why we're doing it because yeah. this is the whole thing understand like this is the basics upon which hockey is built so if you don't if you can't do this if you don't know this stuff then you get to even a slightly higher level you're going to be you can't play you can't play man you know and this is why we always talk about with when you when it comes to training camps um if you go watch a training camp game or a, before the team is picked, you, if you ask any player who knows how to play, they always say it's it's always so hard to play when it's camp games because there's nobody giving us a structure. So all we do is the basic, and the basic isn't enough, right? So for them, they're just like, yeah, I know what my D zone coverage. I know where I'm supposed to be, but is the winger slashing? Is he not slashing? Is he staying wide? Am I supposed to anticipate he's going? Is the center going to be in this spot? And these are the things that now we're not sure about at the higher level, but the foundation is there. Like they know basically I'm going to be here. So that's why it's important that you get this stuff so that later on when things get more complicated, you have a reference point of, oh yeah, we started with this and now we're moving on to that. And I see how we got there from where I'm supposed to be. You know, so that's the whole point of this basic stuff and why I want to do this because it's missing. Like it is just missing. And I see it not just young kids, man. It's not, this isn't just six year olds. Like this is 17 year olds. This is 16 year olds. This is 15 year olds that don't know. They don't know which way their butt is supposed to be in the D zone, you know, and this is, should be, should be done. We should know this by now. Right. So, yes. so that's, uh, well, it's that's, the principle of, of like, it seems, but until you know, you don't know. It, that's what I mean. That's why I don't blame like, the players. No, man. no, no, it's not no, their no, fault. no, no. And and even some coaches, they just like if you haven't played really and you don't understand that, like it's like okay, like is is it better to have the puck outside the dots or inside the dots on the, from a defensive side? It's better to be on the outside of the dots. So if you're anytime you're doing any kind of defensive work you want to make sure that you're working from the inside out, not from the outside in where it's hard. So that's, it's a pretty good principle. So you would think people would know that, but you don't know. You don't actually don't know until you, someone maybe teaches you or points it out. And then your life becomes so much simpler. Yeah. And the, that's the other thing I've gotten some feedback on from coaches when they listen to us talk about this kind of stuff is they knew that, but they didn't know how to say the way we were saying it. And now they're hearing us say it and it's clicking. We're like, oh, I can use that way of explaining it. And that's getting my point across where before I didn't really have the verbiage to to say that so that in a way that they can understand. Yeah. So and another, another way to think of D, D zone and, and, you know, some people don't have an offensive mind either. But if you think of D zone, like you just flip the script and say, what do they want to do? Right. So if you have a puck, if you're an offensive player, where would you like to have the puck? In the house? <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> Right inside, inside, inside the dots. The dots. Yeah. So if the, if the, 
people or the people, the players, the offensive team want to have the puck. Where do they want to put it? They want to put it inside the dots and in the net. So if you give them that, then right, you know what they want then to do already. The outcomes, yeah. So if someone's coming down on a rush on you, like a, a offensive rush, one on one, two on one, two on two, whatever it is, they want to get inside those dots. So your objective is to take what they want away. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I think that's good. Good for me. That's uh, precisely what I wanted to do today. So um, I think the la- last thing I'll say on that is um, the like the dis- abil- ability to make the decisions, like the ability to make decisions in your defensive end anywhere, but in your defensive end, like I said at the start, when people talk about hockey IQ, this is what they're talking about. And this is why, at least partially, I think it's something that can be taught because a lot of kids just don't know the information, just like a lot of coaches don't know. And if you can explain it and I can look at it and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. I've just gained some, some knowledge about hockey now, you know, and I'm, my ability to make decisions is better. If that's how you define hockey IQ, which is how I define it. Your ability to make, definitely part, right. Your ability to make those decisions in the game, the best decision possible. You can see it and you can make it, you know, and this contributes to, to that. So, um, hope, I hope that's kind of helpful. So I think maybe next week and the week after we'll do, uh, same thing, kind of thing with neutral zone and same thing with offensive zone. They might not be the longest episodes ever either, which I think is actually okay. So people can get through it. Yeah. Uh, and for people just listening, you should probably watch this one. So yeah. um, check the video out if you want to see more and we'll post some clips about it too. So uh, that's all for this week. See you guys.